All right, um, I think it's time for us to call the meeting to order. Um, let me maybe just start by introducing all the speakers on the panel that we have today. Yeah. Um, we'll start with um, my left. Uh, we have Professor Dennis Kenji Kipker from the University of Bremen. Uh, he's an expert in cybersecurity law from Germany. And um, I have on my right, Professor Amal, who is executive president for the AI movement, the Moroccan International Center for Artificial Intelligence, Morocco. Um, and then on my far left would be Ms. Nushin, who is senior security researcher, global research and analysis team from Kaspersky in Australia. And of course, on my far right, last but definitely not the least, Ms. Anastasia Kazakova, Cyber Diplomacy Knowledge Fellow from Diplo Foundation, um, flown in from Serbia. And myself, I am Jeannie Sujin Gan, um, Head of Government Affairs and Public Policy for Asia Pacific, Japan, Middle East, Turkey, and Africa regions from Kaspersky. Um, well, um, Today's workshop is titled um, Ethical Principles for the Use of AI in Cybersecurity. And of course, um, by way of a background and setting of the context, um, we basically are currently witnessing a rapid development of AI around the world um, for some time now. And it really has the potential to bring many benefits to the world as we have all probably experienced on a day-to-day -day basis, um, including you know, enhancing the level of cybersecurity. Um, AI algorithms help with rapid identification and response to security threats and automate and enhance the accuracy of threat detection, for instance. And this is something that we experience in Kaspersky because we are a well, cybersecurity um, company. Uh, but of course, while numerous of these general ethical principles and foundations for AI have already been developed by various stakeholders, for example, you know, in 2021, the UNESCO actually adopted the recommendations on the ethics of AI. Um, however, the growing use of, of AI and machine learning components actually in, in cybersecurity makes e ever more urgent the need for ethical principles of AI development, distribution, and utilization in this domain. Um, due to the particular opportunities, but also risks of AI in cybersecurity, there is a need for a broad dialogue for on such you know, specific ethical principles, which we felt you know, today is a good, good opportunity for us to do, sort of discuss that. Um, and also for this reason, um, we, we at Kaspersky actually has developed initial ideas regarding aspects that should be taken into account there. Um, and of course, these will be discussed in today's workshop. Um, so just to sort of run you through the structure of the workshop and what we plan to do in terms of our agenda today, um, we're going to start in a moment to run some survey um, with, with, with um, our audience today, including those who have dialed in online um, with two poll questions, uh, which I'll ask my colleague Johan to pull out in a moment, um, followed by you know some our, our speakers being asked a first round of questions, and then we'll take some questions from the floor as well. Um, and before we end the session today. So I promise, you know, our, our, our panel of speakers are really experts in the, the respective domains and put together, we're gonna expect some um, very good discussions. So um, without further ado, let me just um, invite Johan, who is joining us online and we should be able to see him um, to run the online, the first online poll question. Yes, Johan, we see you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I started the poll. Yes, and we can hear you too. Very good. So the first question Johan will put up um, is, in your opinion, is the use of AI in cybersecurity more likely to strengthen or weaken the level of protection. In your opinion, is the use of AI in cybersecurity more likely to strengthen or weaken the level of protection? 
And of course, we have got options um, for our people who are participating in the poll. Um, of course, the first option is that it will strengthen protection. Second, it will weaken protection. And the third one is, um, um, in the name of democracy, we allow you to say you don't know. <laughs> so let's just give this a moment, um, and I will wait for Johan to... Ah, looking good. Okay. In your opinion, is the use of AI in cybersecurity more likely to strengthen or to weaken the level of protection? I think we've got 62% who have said that it will strengthen protection. Um, let me just write this down. 20% say that it will not, it will in fact weaken. And 20% have exercised their right to say that they don't know. Um, that's good, um, and I think this is something that we will flesh out in a little bit with the presentations from our speakers. Um, I would also want to just um, invite Johan to put up the second poll question. I think we're ready to close this poll. Let's pull out the second poll question. We only have two to start off before we get into the panel discussion, so let's call up the second poll question. The second poll just question. A moment. There are some issues with the technique, but I will do so soon. Okay. Yeah, I will do so. The second poll question is what should yes, prevail? Yeah, we see it. Thank you. The second question is what should prevail in AI regulation, specifically for cybersecurity? Um, of course, the answers include, number one, it should be regulated as heavily as generative AI. Um, second, there is no need for regulation. Um, you know, voluntary adherence is best. Ethical principles would do just good. And of course, the third option would be existing cybersecurity regulation need to be updated to account for AI technologies. I'm not sure if the poll is working well off with the online audience. Let's hear from Johan. It is working, yes. Fantastic, thank you. I will wait some further seconds and then I will end the poll. Thank you. Interesting, interesting. What should prevail in AI regulation specifically for cybersecurity? Only a single choice was allowed, and I think we've got 38% of our audience saying that it should be regulated as heavily as generative AI. Hmm. Nobody selected no need for regulation, so I think we have, well, at least some agreement there. And 63% are saying that existing cybersecurity regulation need to be updated. Um, that's interesting. Let's just park that aside for a while. Um, I think, um, thank you, Johan. We'll have you back with us in our, um, later on in, the, in today's session. Um, we can close the poll. Thank you, Johan. Now, I think... Um, uh, I'm going to be uh, you know, opening up some questions later on to our uh, panelists, but I would first call on Nushin to perhaps, um, she's got some slides for us also, some slides, yeah. And um, I'll just invite Nushin to please deliver uh, some short remarks, her impulse speech on opportunities and risks of AI and cybersecurity and you know, what ethical principles she feels should be developed to promote the opportunities um, and mitigate the risks. Nushin, please. Uh, okay, thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm not sure if the slides, okay, great. So, um, as uh, my colleague uh, perfectly stated, and most of the um, audience agree, um, 
AI, and in particular machine learning, has actually um, helped to strengthen cybersecurity um, in, in a lot of ways. We have been using machine learning techniques in, uh, in our products and at Kaspersky for a long time, so it's not something new for us. But um, uh, as we have always had, um, had this concern about the ethical principles of using AI and machine learning um, in cybersecurity, uh, we thought to um, use this opportunity to share a little bit about um, some of the basic principles that we believe um, that are important in, <coughs> sorry, in the use of AI in cybersecurity. And um, we want to have a discussion today and um, yeah, um, maybe develop these principles further. Let me start with the first principle. Um, so the first, uh, the first one is transparency. Uh, we believe that it's, it's important and it's, um, um, it is the user's right to know if, um, if a cybersecurity solution has been using AI and machine learning. Um, and um, the companies, um, the service providers, need to be transparent about the use of AI. Um, we have um, a, a global transparency initiative, and as part of this initiative, we have transparency centers um, in different countries in the world, and the number is actually growing. We are opening more centers, um, and um, in these centers, uh, stakeholders and um, customers, uh, enterprises, they can go and inspect and visit um, the centers and look at the code of um, our um, products, um, including how AI and machine learning has been used in our products. Um, so we, we uh, commit to being transparent and making sure that uh, users uh, know and consent to their um, um, data and their um, uh, contribution to our, um, um, to our network is, um, is transparent to them and they, um, they are aware of that machine learning techniques are used in, in the products. Um, number two, safety. So when it comes to the use of AI and machine learning in real world, there are um, actually a lot of ways that these systems can be misused by uh, malicious uh, actors uh, to make them um, make the mistakes um, deliberately. Um, so th th there are various um, techniques that the attackers can, can use to uh, try to manipulate the outcome of machine learning um, um, systems and algorithms. That's why we believe that um, having um, safety um, of the, um, um, of the um, AI and machine learning systems um, in, in mind is, is very important. And towards this, um, this principle, we have um, a lot of um, security measures in place, like uh, auditing our systems with, with machine learning, um, with um, um, reducing the, the use of third party data sets for the training for machine learning systems, um, and also um, um, a lot of other techniques such as uh, making sure that we favor the cloud-based uh, machine learning algorithms to, to the ones that are actually um, um, stored and deployed on the user systems. Number three, human control. Um, so we, we all agree that AI can help a lot in, in a lot of um, areas in cybersecurity, um, for example, in, um, in improving uh, detection of malicious behavior, in um, anomaly analysis, and so on. But when it comes to um, sophisticated malware, especially with, with advanced persistent threats, it's very important to understand that the, these type of malware, they mutate, they uh, adapt uh, different techniques, encryption, obfuscation, and so on, uh, to um, actually bypass uh, machine learning and AI systems. Because of this, uh, we always have human control over our um, machine learning systems. And we believe that it's important to have an expert uh, that has uh, good knowledge and understanding and is backed by um, a, um, 
big data set, big data of um, cyber threats uh, to, um, to supervise the outcome of um, machine learning algorithms. That, that's how human control um, has been always there for uh, the systems that we use machine learning for. Um, number four, privacy. When we talk about big data and data, of, uh, data from cyber threats, um, it, it always comes with, uh, with some sort of information that can be, um, can be considered as personal, uh, personal identifier data. So we believe that it's um, users' right to have privacy um, on their uh, personal data. That's why we have a lot of measures to make sure that the privacy of users are uh, considered when it comes to uh, machine learning um, algorithm and the data that is uh, used to train these algorithms by, by many uh, ways like uh, pseudonymizing, anonymizing, reducing the, um, uh, the data collection from users, um, removing personal um, identifiable information from URLs or other data that, is, um, that, that comes from user systems. Um, number five, Develop for cybersecurity. So as our mission to, um, to create a safe world, we are committed to only use and provide services that, are, um, that, that work in defense. So um, along um, with, with, this, um, with this principle, we have the services that use machine learning and AI developed only for defensive, um, um, defensive practices. Um, and we, we encourage other uh, companies to, to join us in this principle too. Um, last but not least, um, that's uh, actually why we are here and we have this discussion here. Um, we are open for dialogue. We believe that it's, it's only through collaboration between uh, various parties and, and between everyone in, and in the um, industry and in, in government sector that we can uh, truly achieve um, the, the best result, the best protection for, uh, for users and user data um, against cyber attacks and cyber threats. So um, that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dushin. Um, I think that sort of, I hope, sets the stage and sort of sets the tone um, to today's discussion because we really are focusing, um, for those who have just joined us, we are focusing our um, workshop today, really discussing um, the ethical principles for the use of AI in cybersecurity. And also, um, I think I would just want to take this time to sort of hear from a more technical, scientific perspective from um, Amal on how can uh, the microphone maybe, um, last year, okay. yeah. How can AI uh, or machine learning techniques contribute to cybersecurity and which issues can emerge while using AI techniques for cybersecurity and how can we solve these issues? Um, I think you also have some slides, if we can put up some slides. Yes, we see them. Hello everybody. Uh, I am uh, very happy to talk about AI in cybersecurity, and uh, I think that uh, uh, there is a need of regulation like uh, uh, most people voted uh, earlier. <laughs> so, uh, my presentation will be very short, uh, even if there are a lot of points, but mainly I would like to emphasize why, when, where AI can be used in cybersecurity because uh, the ethical problems comes from the way uh, we will use AI in cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, the context is that, as you know, as you all know, uh, cybersecurity is uh, a very huge uh, problem for all software uh, around. And uh, in, the, in this presentation, as uh, Jenny said, I will address some points related to how AI is included in cybersecurity systems. So, uh, as you know, Kaspersky detected, detects like uh, 325,000 new malicious files every day. And this comes from a report 
FireEye uh, in 2017, so I think today there are much more. Uh, the problem with, with, um, with classical methods for cybersecurity is that they are, uh, there is slow detections and also slow neutralizations. And what we expect uh, from AI is to enhance and transform cybersecurity methods by providing uh, predictive intelligence and long life ci in long life cycle of the, the software. So the role of AI, um, more specifically in cybersecurity, is twofold. Uh, the, first, um, the first thing is that AI can automate uh, common cybersecurity tasks like vulnerability management, threat detections, etc. And also, thanks to AI, we can identify threats in large data, data sets that have not been al analyzed manually. So, uh, as you can see, cybersecurity and AI is a national security priority by the NSF, NSTC, and NASA today. Uh, so, what I want to present is that there are two kinds of AI. Uh, the first, uh, Mm, the first boxes in the left represent what we call a blue AI. And in the, the right, you have uh, the red AI. The blue AI is, uh, presents some opportunities for cybersecurity. For example, AI will help to create smart cybersecurity. For example, uh, effective security controls, uh, automatic vulnerability discovery, etc. And also, in the fourth point, by using AI, you can fight cyber criminals, for example, for fraud detections, analysis, intelligence encryption, fight against fake news, etc. And this is the good news for using AI in cybersecurity. But as you know, cybersecurity, uh, these techniques or these AI systems are also vulnerable and raise a lot of challenges like robustness, vulnerability of algorithms, of AI algorithms, and also some misuses of AI. For example, by creating fake videos, AI-powered malware, smarter social engineering attacks, etc. So uh, AI for cybersecurity, I will go very fast, uh, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, AI in the domain of cybersecurity will help in all these uh, steps and this is the NIST CSF framework, identify, ident how to identify, understand your assets and resources, protect by developing and implementing appropriate protection measures, detect by identifying the, the occurrence of a uh, cybersecurity event, respond by taking action in if cybersecurity event is detected, and finally restore activities that aim uh, to maintain resilience plans. So this is the life cycle uh, of cybersecurity, defensive cybersecurity, and AI can be used at all the stages of this life cycle. So I can say that the ethical issues of using AI in cybersecurity can be studied through these five steps. For example, if you identify uh, your asset and your, you should be sure that your resources are resilient, are uh, not vulnerable, to protect also and detect, etc. So, how do we uh, implement all this in uh, you, by using uh, by using AI techniques? I will not detail all the phases, but for example, in identification step, we will use. Uh, some tasks, if I address some tasks of cybersecurity like fuzzing, pen testing, etc., the, the techniques of AI that I will be able to use, and they are used uh, in practice today, are deep learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning and reinforcement learning for, for classification of bugs, and also some NLP and methods of machine learning. This means that all the problems that that come with AI techniques will be uh, we, we will be found again in uh, dealing with cybersecurity. So this is only uh, one step identification, and we can deploy. It. I don't have time. This is why I cut. But we can do the same for all these phases in cybersecurity.
system. So now we can use also uh, techniques from cybersecurity to securize or to make AI system more robust. And this is a challenge uh, of red AI. Robustness, vulnerability of AI algorithms. For example, there are very well-known adversarial machine learning techniques that can be used uh, to secure uh, or to attack uh, AI systems and uh, algorithms. Also, uh, this is why I say that adversarial AI attacks AI systems. AI cannot be made unconditionally safe like any other technology. So we have to take care that our AI system used in cybersecurity will not be attacked by malicious attacks or something else. Uh, so this is a very famous example uh, in computer vision uh, we can use in... Uh, if you look at the pictures, they are similar. But the AI system will detect different things. It's just a question of changing one pixel sometimes in picture, and you can have a different output. For example, uh, you have the, the right one, the left one, you can see a car, uh, this is correct, but in the, the, the left one, you can see ostrich. The, the, the system we recognize, we recognize, but people cannot, I mean, human beings cannot see the difference. But machine, system, machine, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm will, do the, will make the difference. Okay, so last thing is uh, misuse of AI, for example, by creating fake videos. They are very famous today and AI-powered malware, smarter social engineering attacks, and so on. And I will end with this. So we know today that AI can create new, cyber, new kinds of cyber attacks uh, for phishing, cyber extortion, automated interactive attacks, etc. For example, using generative AI in cyber extortion is something very, uh, very common today. So the, the need of regulation is uh, crucial. I mean, it's, it's very important. We, ha we, ha we inherit all the, um, all the problems, the issues coming from software, but we have also some very specific uh, problems for cybersecurity domain. And um, AI will bring major ethical and regul regulatory challenges also in cybersecurity. So my conclusion is that uh, I agree we need uh, ethical and regulatory consideration for uh, cybersecurity systems. Uh, delegations of control, we have to find a consensus between uh, human total control and total autonomy of AI systems. Delegations of control will be granted with this sole objective and not towards total autonomy of the AI mm. in cybersecurity. Mm. And uh, cybersecurity actors are still looking for an adequate legal basis to conduct their daily testing practices for privacy and data governance, for example, in cybersecurity. Mm. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, that was wonderful. And I'm already I'm madly taking notes because I'm going to have to synthesize all of this. Um, but before I, I, I do so and really do a full on, you know, panel discussion with perhaps some questions from the floor, I'd like to just pass the time over to Anastasia. Um, who will be talking with us, you know, some about, about some of the current trends and reflections on AI policies, in particular in the field of cybersecurity, um, and, um, you know, maybe an impulse statement by Anastasia on the chances and risks and the value of ethical principles. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I represent the civil society organization. I work on a policy before I work in the private sector. A cybersecurity expert also focuses on the policy. Um, and in my current work, we will also discuss with the multi-stakeholders how the cyber norms for responsible behavior could be implemented. Um, and while we are not solely focused on AI, we largely focus on the 
norms um, for responsible behavior in the context of international security and peace in the context of overall cyber stability. Um, AI policy is definitely um, getting more and more attention. So um, thanks so much for the previous speakers. I think we've seen indeed that um, AI already entered the world of cybersecurity, I think quite many years ago. It helps to enhance detection, it helps to collect um, intelligence for better analysis of the cyber threats. And I think um, many, if not all, cybersecurity uh, companies these days, especially advanced companies, do apply to some extent AI in the methods, how they deal with the threats and what the intelligence they produce for the customers. Um, the big question though, how does it work? What kind of a data do the companies use for this? How actually the AI, which still quite unknown for many even who develop AI in terms of the mysterious black box, what happens there? If, they, it, if it makes decisions, how it made a particular decision? So all these really important questions, I think one of the key fundamental challenges that not only on the minds of the policymakers, but on the minds of the users, but also on the minds of those who develop AI and AI-based solutions. And in this regard, um, yeah, the human control and retaining human control, I think all the speakers have said already, it's really fundamental. AI should not be autonomous because we cannot allow something that we don't know exactly or completely to allow it to somehow make so much big impact on our human life. And we see that humans are afraid of this, right? But um, even though the policymakers already have started talking and discussing how to make AI more predictable, transparent, ethical, uh, the question is still if, okay, we give the, we retain the human control, we give back the control to humans, those who develop, who sort of academics who would like to see what are the algorithms are used there. The question is still uh, quite challenging how this control will be split up between actors and which actors would be sort of on the table. Um, who would, in the end, retain the biggest control among humans? Would it be the developers of the AI or the policymakers of the academia? How to, how to ensure that actually the data that has been collected on a massive scale for the AI is not monopolized by one actor or just a few actors on the market? How to make sure that um, academia, again, civil society has access to analyze what kind of a data and under which policies, which processes it's been used and that uh, data protection security are properly mitigated. So these are really, I think, open questions. It's really difficult questions. They are very contextual questions. If we speak about the in terms of the impacts for society, for economy, for security, for international security, all of these questions will be, I think, decided on the particular context and it's really important and it's really challenging, therefore. One of the other challenges, I think, um, in all the emerging um, policies or even the regulations to make it more transparent, more ethical, is, of course, to, do, to define AI. Um, there's, I think, no universal definition so far what the AI is. Um, and the policymakers, I think, have a really struggled to carefully scope future laws to pin down what AI exactly entails in a particular context. Um, so one of the aspects that's really important for policymakers and for legislators to make sure that the laws focus on the outcomes and expectations, but not the technology itself. It will help actually to make these laws more future prone um, and it will focus on what actually concerns people. People, I think users, we as a just ordinary users, we don't want to know how the code is written for that. We do want to know how this code will impact our lives, how this will impact our security, how this will impact our jobs or well, the community or society or the broader scale. The other aspect, aspect that I also wanted to mention that even though currently we can, I think, um, name lots of policies or regulations narrowly in the field of a cyber security in terms of AI and cyber security. And here I would actually agree with the audience that participated in a poll. And I think most of the people said that it's rather the existing cyber security regulation needs to be strengthened 
rather than new regulation only on AI and cybersecurity needs to be developed. And I agree with this. Uh, um, I think that it's really important to see broadly and more on a horizontal level how AI is a one more technology, is a one more piece of code in the end, even though it's really complicated, fascinated, fascinating, and it's difficult piece of code. But still, um, how it actually produces um, how which impacts it produces for different stakeholders. And in this regard, they are already emerging in existing laws to regulate the security of data in particular contexts, to regulate the security of the critical infrastructure, um, and so on. And AI, I believe, complicates the picture, but doesn't require um, a new approach from scratch. So um, yes, it complicates a lot the current picture, and it requires innovative, probably discussions. But still, um, we need to look at the again at the at the impacts what the technology gives to us. Um, I also wanted to say that um, we do see the emerging discussions in terms of the impacts of where on the international security in peace, likely within the UN and within uh, the regional fora, um, but still they're not that extensive as they should be. Uh, the problem is that um, still I think the international community and those who engaged in these discussions, including diplomats, still um, lack substantial evidence how many advanced AI tools, if they exist, um, can be used for both defense and offensive purposes. Uh, the still the knowledge um, is very limited. There's a lot of secrecy about this. Um, it's the knowledge that is not accessible to a broader public, to a broad public, or to even a limited group of the academics, unfortunately. So um, there are at the same time growing interests and calls of, of the international community to produce the sort of the rules of the road, how to regulate AI in terms of cybersecurity, especially where AI can be used in the military context on the battlefield, and I think it's really important. Um, but hopefully we will see more, probably, dynamics, but so far, again, I highlight to have these discussions more evidence-based and more substantive, we need to understand what kind of the tools already out there, and to increase the transparency in terms of the different types of the actors that are involved in um, cyber activity. And I would probably conclude to this question saying that um, overall speaking of the regulations, I think it's already evident that the large markets such as the EU, US, uh, China, other countries probably will pass conflicting regulations uh, concerning AI quite soon. I think we heard yesterday from the US diplomat that US is um, preparing the executive order on the artificial intelligence soon. And the G7 leaders, they also have committed to establish a set of the guiding rules for the AI. So we see the appetite, we see the appetite to actually split, to define the roles, who will have the ultimate power to define the impacts of the AI in the future. Will it be the governments, which governments? Will it be the vendors, the companies? And how to make sure that it's just the one and a few companies the problem is that if it happens and if more fragmentation happens in this field, how it happens overall in cybersecurity and in cyberspace, unfortunately, um, it will make, um, I think, less opportunities for different communities to truly benefit from um, learning what the AI could uh, bring to us as the international community, as a society. There are still beliefs, I think, and hopes that uh, vendors or organizations or companies could take a lead and organize sort of the consortium and to uh, make a self-voluntary um, approach, self-regulation -reg approach to be more transparent. And what we just heard from Kaspersky, I think it's um, it's a good initiative. We uh, hear more and more initiatives, of especially companies involved, extensively involved in AI, to be more active and uh, saying that what kind of the data they use, how they process this data. And I think there's still a hope, optimistic hope that if this um, if this conversation continues, probably a uh, bottom up approach would lead, and in this regard, sort of there will be more opportunities to avoid the risk of conflicting laws of the fragmentation in this field, and probably to make sure that still the access 
to this technology, to the research, to the discussion, will be much broader than just you know within the borders of one particular country of of few countries. But I think there's still the open questions. There's many open questions, um, and all of the to some extent all the emerging policies try to address this. Um, in terms of the result, to what conclusions we will come, I think that's open question. So let's see how humans will be uh, optimistic or pessimistic solving this. Thank you. Thank you, Nastya. Um, I would just want to finish off this um, you know, uh, preliminary round of remarks with um, inviting Dennis to sort of speak about, you know, can AI be legally regulated at all? given the current political and technical difficulties with the AI Act in Europe, for example, and aren't we destroying innovation through legal, um, through overregulation? So maybe I'll just hand the time over to Dennis. Yeah, thank you very much, Jenny, and thank you for the possibility um, to speak here today. Um, as a professor for cybersecurity law, I definitely have a legal perspective on the whole topic. Um, and in regulating um, AI, we definitely need to um, draw a clear line, um, as it was already um, noted by the previous speakers, uh, because we are not talking just about general AI regulation here, uh, but about a very um, specific use case. And that means an example just uh, a piece, a slice of a broad use case scenario. And um, in my opinion, um, AI and cybersecurity um, are two topics um, that have already come together a long time um, before use cases um, like generative AI became public um, in the recent month. And for example, um, AI is used with regard to cybersecurity in automated anomaly detection um, in networks, and I already wrote some publications about that six years ago. Um, and this, of course, um, begs the question regarding this very specific use case. Do we need a special AI regulation for cybersecurity uh, in the future? And my answer uh, with regard to that is quite clear. I would say no. Um, this might be interesting, but to justify this, um, in my opinion, we need to differentiate again um, because there are three different um, use case scenarios that we will have to talk about and that we'll have to take a closer look onto. So the so first one is um, AI is used um, to improve cybersecurity. The second one, um, AI is used to compromise cybersecurity. And the third one, AI in general um, is being developed. And uh, the first two scenarios um, are from a legal perspective um, quite easy to answer. So uh, when I is used, uh, AI is used to improve cybersecurity, um, it is technically um, one of several possible measures um, that can improve cyber resilience. Um, for example, European lawmakers, uh, who in my opinion um, currently lead the world in cybersecurity uh, legislation, for example, with the new Network Information Security Directive uh, that became effective in the beginning of, of this year, or for example, also the draft version of the Cyber Resilience Act. We have a lot of upcoming cybersecurity regulation and uh, the point is, regarding this cybersecurity specific uh, legislation, um, the European lawmakers have so far avoided um, exclusively naming specific um, technologies to realize an appropriate level of cybersecurity and have, instead of that, um, used the general term state of the art of technology, uh, which is a general guideline um, in many uh, legal regulations of technology um, um, such as cybersecurity as well. So it means, for example, private companies, uh, public institutions that implement cybersecurity um, have to fulfill the state of the art of technology to be compliant um, with the legal rules. And this, in my opinion, as a lawyer, is, is very fitting because um, a law will never be able uh, to conclusively um, map all the technologies that will be developed in the future uh, that are needed, especially here for cybersecurity, in a casuistic sense, um, due to all the rapid um, technological development that we have. And we have very fast development cycles, not currently, but also in the future. And this is also widely accepted, this opinion, by the scientific community. Um, the second use case scenario that I would like to mention, so that means when cyber um, attackers use AI to compromise IT systems. This is also not a specific um, AI cybersecurity scenario because, again, um, as 
was defending against cyber attacks, attackers um, may, may well use different technologies to successfully attack IT systems as well. And these are typically um, criminal offenses. Um, and in many countries, in various countries all over the world, we have also cyber criminal um, law. And um, these criminal offenses in the national cyber criminal legislations um, are being interpreted. And as a part of this legal interpretation, um, they already cover the use of AI as a means of attack, uh, as a technical means of attack, without the need for explicit regulation. And now um, we come to the third point um, of this very short statement. Um, the third aspect um, was that um, AI is not, so the th third aspect is not directly related to cybersecurity, um, but uh, to the development of AI. And we already heard some statements about um, development of AI, um, of how keeping AI secure when it is uh, being developed. Um, and of course, this is an important question that we also have to address from a legal perspective. But this um, development issue of AI um, cannot be considered a cybersecurity specific issue. So um, it requires a focus and of course um, it must be ensured, for example, as Amal mentioned, that AI systems are not um, themselves compromised at this, at this very important stage. And that's something um, that we've um, talked about um, in several panels um, during this conference. And this is also uh, what the European AI Act, as a um, regulation that has also been mentioned already for several times, for example, um, um, seeks to achieve. Um, when it explicitly, in its draft version uh, that was made public last year, stipulates uh, that AI itself must be cyber secure. And therefore, um, developers um, of AI must provide uh, safeguards uh, to prevent, for example, manipulation um, of training data sets or to prevent hostile input uh, to manipulate um, an AI's response. And this is also something I guess Amar mentioned. Um, but this, in my opinion, is just one facet um, of secure and safe AI development uh, and not really a use case for implementation um, of AI in cybersecurity. Um, so to come to a conclusion as a result, um, in my opinion, um, the regulation of, an, uh, of AI and cybersecurity um, must uh, thus clearly um, differentiate between um, scenarios um, in which AI is only one of several um, possible technical means and um, the regulation of AI um, specific risks themselves. And I think this is an important point uh, which has to be taken into the policy debate um, and into the future legal debate as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dennis, for that. Um, so I think so far what we have heard um, beginning with the ethical principles that were sort of put forward by Nushin, um, on transparency, safety, human control, privacy, defensive cybersecurity, and being open for dialogue have pretty much been also agreed upon in various different ways. Um, first of all, of course, we heard from uh, Amal about the, the, the framework, the five steps to defensive cybersecurity, the life cycle, and identifying, protecting, detecting, responding, and restoring, um, which also, of course, um, sort of dovetail with uh, various aspects of those ethical principles which were put forward by Nushin on safety, human control, privacy, and defensive cybersecurity. And then, of course, also we heard from Nastya about um, transparency, elements of transparency as well, as, of course, that multi-stakeholder cooperation perspective to things, um, um, amongst other things, of course, and, of course, Dennis had also highlighted some of the limitations of regulation and the need for um, um, some ethical principles that, that overlay. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about all of these in a short while. But I thought I wanted to take this time to open the floor to some possible questions. Because otherwise, I am going to ask a round of questions. I see that there are no, um, I'm just going to ask Johan if you have got any questions from the online participants. Otherwise, I would be quite ready to launch into my round of questions. Yes, there is a question there in the room. Can I just ask you to take the mic? Yeah. Ah, you have a, okay. You have to turn on the mic, push the button up. Thank you. 
All right, thank you for the presentations as well. So the question from my side, although the ethical question is more philosophical approach for sure, uh, when I look at the cybersecurity, because the adversary is going to use ad adversarial AI and they don't care about ethics. Now for us to defend, and I see that uh, detection might be where we might imply the ethical um, approaches, but when we are talking about response, especially about active cyber defense and engaging in responsive actions, implying ethical uh, AI to counter an unethical adversarial AI actually might put us in a disadvantage. Um, maybe I would like to hear your approaches or your thoughts on this as well. All right, uh, maybe I'll ask Nastia to take that question. Thank you for that question, first of all. That's a good question. I think this question already exists before they are right overall. If the organization that been is attacked, if the organization has the right, and if it has a possibility, if it's still the organization has the right to hack back, right? There's all discussions of the hackbacks, if they're legal, if they're lawful, if they could be legitimate a particular situation. I think um, in most of the countries, um, the governments and industry came to the conclusion that um, organizations probably shouldn't have this right. So that the law enforcement that uh, have the mandate per law should step in and actually if the organization asks for this help so the law enforcement or other specialized agencies can investigate and then decide how to do depending on what type of the actor the organization dealing with, whether it is a cyber espionage, if the APT, it's of course the matter of the international security of the relations of the two of the more countries, it's really um, getting more critical, but if, if it's a sort of really advanced complicated DDoS or a sort of deficient with the AI, right? So whether organization has this right, um, I think it, will be really risky to uh, go into this direction. But overall, as you said, it's a really philosophical how we would define um, ethics in this regard um, and why we as a better, good actors need to be ethical was a lot of bad actors that behave unethical. Well, again, I think it's a really risky conversation that might um, take because uh, we need to define what's our goal. Our goal is to enhance sort of security for our all, some sort of optimal collective security, and our goal is to enhance stability. Whether uh, if us as a good actress behaving unethical to protect, even to protect ourselves, is a part of the security and stability in the end, I think not likely. So we still need to well, abide to international law, domestic law, national law, and overall sort of the rules to make sure that if there's a bad actress that acting as a bad, act, bad actress, we stay sort of stay on the, on the side where we do understand the limits of our actions. Um, but I don't want to conclude on a pessimistic note, uh, but still on a hopeful note. Um, the challenges that we see and in the cyberspace, they of course get more and more sophisticated and, uh, and it's not purely technical thing, right? And this is what makes it really difficult. If that's technical, so the technical people will solve it. The problem is with um, much more nuanced, sometimes um, policy um, solutions with the international security solutions. Um, uh, so in this regard, I think we need, as a humans uh, who try to protect ourselves, be, I think, even more creative. Yes, that's difficult, but we have to do so. Be creative in terms of focus on what we already have for centuries. It's international law. Again, it's the national law. But also be creative how the new types of responses could be developed in this regard. How we could enhance cooperation between communities, between vendors who could share the knowledge with the outputs of their research or even the government, despite the current geopolitical situation, how could we increase our chances to develop those creative solutions to address the threats that are getting more and more complicated to us? Again, that's difficult, but I think there's a lot of hope that it will be developed more and more, because I think we all want, in the end, the security for us all.
Thanks for that. Um, I thought I'll also give um, pay some attention to the questions from our online participants. Um, there was one question from Yasuki Saito, um, and I think I'd like to ask um, Nushin to take this question. Um, it says, what do you think of using LLM or ChatGPT to deceive human users and force their PCs to be infected by malwares? Is there any good way to avoid such things? Nushin? Um, Okay, um, I guess uh, we heard from um, uh, from Amal about um, about this uh, particular um, type of attack, like advanced social engineering enabled by AI, and this is a perfect example um, to use an AI system to um, to make a more convincing um, I don't know, social engineering either a conversation or um, or an email or a message that looks very um, that looks very benign and doesn't raise any suspicion. Um, and um, this, is, this is just one example of how um, AI can be misused by uh, malicious actors. Um, but I would say still um, with, with an um, advanced and sophisticated security solution, um, obviously having machine learning techniques um, implemented into that solution can, can also help to, to identify um, a, um, a spear phishing um, um, email or um, or even a social engineering attack, but but also um, apart from um, having uh, having an advanced solution to to address and to protect users against um, such such attacks, um, I, uh, I would say that. Um, talking and, and um, raising awareness about such attacks um, because they, um, I mean, um, I'm sure that the attackers, uh, especially with the use of AI, um, they can um, they can buy and bypass a lot of um, services. They, it's it's much easier. It, it would be much easier to uh, understand if the victim w was the, the target. Uh, environment and ha and is how how the environment is. What are the softwares? What are the security security measures in place uh, in their target environment? And try to um, figure out a way to to bypass that. So uh, I would say um, something to to complement an advanced uh, solution would be um, just um, education. Um, for uh, for common users and also for employees in uh, in organizations to um, to understand the risks and understand how AI can can help in making a more convincing um, like conversation or uh, or a more convincing uh, spear phishing uh, email um, and uh, yeah make sure that that users are are aware and uh, they don't um, they don't fall victim. Thanks for that. Um, so I think just taking stock of what we have so far, yeah, um, from the poll, from the from the survey results, and also from the discussion, I think first of all, what we're hearing is that obviously um, AI and cybersecurity um, has 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 produced a lot of um, benefits, right? And we can't run away from the use of AI and cybersecurity. But second of all, of course, it comes with costs, right? There, is, there are impacts, there are unintended consequences. And just now, Amal actually um, brought up some statistics from Kaspersky um, several years ago about the number of new malicious files that were detected on a daily basis. And uh, just uh, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I thought I could also give an update on the statistics um, as of today. Actually, um, Kaspersky uncovers and finds on a daily basis more than 400,000 new unique malicious files every day and that's not that that's 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 astounding um, and when I talk about new malicious unique malicious files we're talking you know about maybe one malware that infects 10,000 computers let's just say that's not counted as 10,000 that's considered that's counted as one if it's the same malware so if we're here, all of us sitting here in this room um, for an hour and a half for this workshop, we're essentially talking about what, 27,000, 30,000 new unique malicious files uncovered by a single company like Kaspersky. 
Um, so that's astounding. So there are costs and there are benefits, um, you know, to, to, to the use of AI in, in, in cybersecurity that, that we need to be concerned about. And that brings me to the third point, which is that, you know, it, which, it, which is the reason for our discourse today that we're having, this, this, what we're all talking about. Um, and we discussed then what are the role what's the role of, of laws and regulations and all that, right? And then we also hear that, you know, we, we then start thinking about not just regulation, but what exactly are you regulating? And why are we regulating? Um, and then we also hear discussions about conflicting regulations, which are beginning to surface, right, globally. Um, and so then what that brings us to would be that there are limitations to regulations. There are limitations to regulations. And, and, and as a lawyer, I'm saying this, you know, that anything that is legal may also not be ethical. So do we then right, take a step forward and then start thinking about ethical principles beyond just legal frameworks? And that is, I think, where we are today. And I think we have a question from the floor. Um, sir, can I just ask that you take the mic and introduce yourself and give us a question? Thank you. Hi there, this is Martin Bottemon. I've been talking with the DC IoT today as well. And one of the complexities that comes up when you have talk about AI and cybersecurity I agree with uh, what has been said, but a complication is that security will require identity. And I can see specifically with AI that has a dual impact. One thing is that data, thanks to AI, become even more often personally identifiable than before. But the other thing is that AI can also help uh, secure, as has been uh, pointed out, but maybe also with, uh, with the identity factor. So how do you deal with the dichotomy between identity need in the future going forward? There's no way around it. At the same time, uh, also privacy. And this is part of your, your, your uh, legal considerations, of, of course, as well, and ethical. Okay, all right, um, I will leave Dennis to this, take this question. Yeah, of course, um, when developing AI, we have high impact privacy risks, and I think this is quite clear. Um, from the European Union perspective speaking, we have a general data protection regulation, uh, which addresses the use of personal data, um, also uh, when AI is being trained. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to the possibilities and also the problems of AI regulation, I think in general um, we need to move away from, from trying to regulate every um, conceivable scenario and risk. We have risk, definitely, um, but this is not a typical thing of AI. So this is a thing that addresses the whole technology sector. And um, on one hand, um, full technology regulation will, in my opinion, never be possible. And on the other hand, um, administrative practices um, also raise the question, for example, of who should control and implement all these laws, because uh, you will need a lot of resources, and we, we see it with regard to data privacy authorities, I think not only in, in the European Union, but all over the world, uh, that they have problems, that they are struggling in implementation of laws. There are always companies that are not compliant, and uh, this is, of course, uh, a question that is not AI-specific. Um, legally, um, it has long been proven um, that what matters is not the severity um, of sanctions um, after a certain kind of viola violation, um, but the likelihood um, of detection of a violation. And I think this is uh, where we, ne we need to work. So uh, what this means, in my opinion, for AI, 
um, in the in the wake of the current hype that we've seen uh, since the beginning of the, of this year, that uh, we should not fall uh, into a mindless, in my opinion, mindless regulatory debate uh, that possibly ends up even delaying or even torpedoing um, the really necessary regulation. So we need definitely a core regulation, but we have to distinguish between things that are necessary and that are not not necessary for the first start. And in my opinion, um, the European AI Act, and of course its draft version, with its different risk classes, um, is a good first approach um, for the time being. Um, even, of course, it needs to be revised again because we have seen this year that there have been some new upcoming risks. Um, and since um, AI is also not mainly not developed by states, uh, but currently in the hands of just a few uh, big tech players, mostly um, coming from the US, um, the cooperation um, between the state and uh, the industry actors um, really um, needs to improve. And this is where we need to work on as well. So self-regulation by industry is, in my opinion, um, alone not enough. Um, we need a system of transparency. We need more cooperation um, that needs to be established uh, on a permanent um, legal basis. And when we talk about ethical principles, and this is also part of this session, I think ethical principles um, can help, of course, uh, but um, the authorities uh, for supervision of AI, they must be stronger. So that means they need more financial resources. Uh, they will need more personnel resources in the future so that we can tackle all these problems. Thank you. I think I'll ask Professor Amal to also add on, and then Nastya can do so as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm trying to answer the question about um, identity and security. And I think, um, in fact, when, when, we, when we talk about security, we are, we are naturally uh, interested in the identity of the person we try to secure, for example. But uh, there are some initiatives around the world uh, where we can, um, the, the purpose is to try to make a difference between identifier and identity of person. And this is uh, very interesting because you can rely on a trust third party to certify that, for example, that person is associated to that identifier. So we don't have access to the identity of the, the whole identity of the person. And another very uh, nice um, initiative is um, to avoid to have unique identifier of a person. This allow to not have access to 360 degree of the person itself. So it's sectorial identifier that is associated with the same identity, which is associated through it, a third party trust to some person. And you add all these layers to avoid the direct access to a person with all data of the person, because anonymous, anonymity of data is not enough today. I don't know if this already answers your question, but um, I'm also curious to know what you think as well. Um, that's the question that you ask is really, well, they are very um, specific, but they're really critical, of course, and I would probably say not um, the most popular opinion, but I believe that regulations are not the only solution. Quite often, I think regulations could be really slow and not that effective to address the challenges that we face, especially with AI. We still don't know how the AI will impact us in a week. It's really rapidly developing. Uh, so. While regulations are important in terms of the nudge developers, manufacturers of the products, um, tech companies to move in the right direction with the legal and the regulatory action sort of to put the incentives, right incentives on the market for them, I still believe that the industry has the capacity and has the ability to do lots of really important things without policymakers and regulators being in the room. So for Software, there's a lot of initiatives going on, sort of the Software Bill of Materials, ASBOM. The idea is to uh, increase transparency of the composition of the software that you're using. Sort of the, if you take a cake, you need to know what kind of the ingredients there to make sure that it will not 
make any harm to you given your dietary um, specifics. So the same logic applies to software. Even if you're the bigger company, you need to have a um, detailed documentation, updated, automated documentation that could be actually machine readable to understand what types of the core components there, how could you use, and if there's a vulnerability, you could easier to find the core component could be exploited. So I think the same logic could be applied to those who develop AI-based solutions. Increase transparency of the components that you use. Increase also the data documentation, document um, what type of the data sources, collection methods, processing techniques that you apply. Yes, it probably will be useful only to the most advanced customers and the large corporations, but these companies also do have their own users, and I think that will have indirect positive security effect for us all. So hopefully it takes time, but I think it's might be more agile rather than wait uh, extensive regulation to be passed on. Thank you for that, Nastya. And I think your point about the software bill of materials is really something that resonates with me because, you know, that's also something that, you know, at Kaspersky we practice for our software. Uh, we do, I think it's, it is important to know the ingredients to the cake that you're about to eat. Um, I think Professor Amal wants to add on something and I, perhaps you want to also give a response later on. Yeah. Professor Amal, maybe just go ahead first. Yeah. Because we are talking about ethics from the beginning, and we, we don't specify what, what do we mean with ethics. And I think uh, ethics is not limited to data protection, but also to we have to consider dignity uh, to protect human rights. For example, uh, when, when you detect some malicious attack, for example, you should be careful with the origin of that uh, attack. Fairness, uh, privacy, and also uh, informed consent. And my point is, is, what do we mean by informed consent? When, when people give uh, some data, some information, um, interact with the, with the system, like for example in generative AI systems, uh, people are not aware of the consequences of the tool they use. And they give consent, they, they think that they are informed, but in fact, they are not informed. Because most of people are very far from technology. And most, uh, most of them have no idea on cyber systems. So what do we mean by informed consent? How do we protect uh, dignity in these situations? Yeah, th thank you for that. Uh, what we ended up with, <coughs> it's not emotions, it's just my throat dry. Uh, what we ended up with this morning in the discussion was very much that, of course, legal isn't enough. Legal is the last resort in a way. Uh, so, uh, uh, whereas we've been talking a lot about privacy and security by design, I think it's important to realize that in AI context, that is an extra challenge. But it's a challenge we're also facing. For instance, uh, the, thank you to the refer uh, reference to the uh, European Union's AI Act. But we're also aware that, uh, of course, the, the Algorith Algorithmic Accountability Act is uh, coming up in the USA. And you see that that is ways where uh, we may end up with AI not being just this magic, but something real and concrete where we can take responsibility for. I think that that's an important element. So, so, f so thank you for your answers. And it, it's just, we don't know all the answers yet. I very much realize that. But the, 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 the old principles of security by design uh, and, and privacy by design remain important. We realize we live in a world where in some countries, identity is there to protect you and some others, uh, it, will, it may make you victim. So thank you, thank you very much for your thoughts. All right, um, I think, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think I am going to 
I'm mindful of the time. We have about 11 minutes left, and I'm trying to economize the time left that we have, because not forgetting that we also still have one more survey for our online participants before we conclude today's discussion. So I sort of just want to go um, down the, 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 the row and maybe begin with Nushin. Um, it's the same question for all our speakers, actually. So I'm going to ask the question um, for each of you. Maybe just try to keep your remarks short, one minute, two minute max. Yeah. Um, which of the which are the two most important principles in your view that definitely need to be followed in cybersecurity? The two most important ethical principles. Yeah. Um, that's actually a very very good question. Um, the the most the two most important principles for me. I think that mm, there are the, the two main points that, that's been discussed uh, more than other principles today. So first one, transparency. So being transparent uh, to, to the users and also to the rest of the community and world, what, what, what we do with the user data and how we implement detections and how we protect uh, users, be it um, through a machine learning technique, an algorithm, or uh, more like um, don't know, traditional ways. Uh, and the second one is um, obviously privacy. Uh, we are in cyber security um, industry, um, it, and, and we deal with, uh, with targets and victims of cyber attacks. For us, um, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the one of the most important uh, aspects to uh, protect users. And obviously, if we don't um, take care of the privacy, and privacy of user data uh, ourselves, it doesn't um, make much sense to, to try to protect them from cyber attackers, right? So I would say um, transparency and um, privacy for me. Thank you very much, Nushin. I'll just, just go down the room with, for Dennis. I'm hoping you, I'm secretly hoping you will touch on some other principles, but, but this, of course, is <laughs> the democratic Yeah, that's, that's, that's really a difficult question. Um, so to make a long story short, um, as a scientist, um, I can say that even with paradigmatic events like, like AI, we should move to the level of factual argumentation. So this is something I mentioned several times uh, also in my opening statement. We do not... Um, eliminate um, problems just by, by regulation alone. Um, this is my opinion an illusion. Um, even, even if uh, legislators and politicians might see it uh, differently. And in and, and cyber security, um, we need to clearly align ourselves uh, with the three scenarios of AI um, that I have also been mentioning in my, in my opening statement. And uh, in terms of the principles, I find it very difficult to just say we have two principles that are relevant because um, the use of AI, not only in cybersecurity, but everywhere has so many facets and um, different risks that we do not have approached yet. And I think one of the most important things is that we have human control um, about decisions. And this is something which is also clearly described. And this is also described um, with regard to the use of personal data, for example, or with regard to decisions of authorities, official decisions, or any kind of decisions of private companies that might have a negative impact on individuals that these decisions cannot be made only based um, um, on AI. And in my opinion, the second important principle, um, I would say, is that safety um, comes first. Um, we have to distinguish between um, security and safety. I think this cannot be done here in a few minutes, but um, when it comes to AI, we have a lot of use cases for, you, uh, for the use of AI, and um, that means um, that security is connected very strongly with safety, and we should take a strong look onto all these safety issues, because um, when the AI is not developed securely, we cannot have safe solutions as a result of the AI. So in my opinion, um, these uh, would be the two utmost important principles um, putting on top uh, of the principle of, of the one new machine set. Thank you. That's great. Um, Amal, would you like to give us your two most important principles in, in your view? Uh, if we are talking about principles of ethics, I think. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, because we are talking about ethics like if it's uh, stamps we put on product. And ethics is not that. Ethics is continuous debate and discussion about how things will go ahead. So from my opinion, the first thing we have to, uh, to take care of is how to preserve dignity and human rights in all these systems. And the second is to work to reach informed consent with population that use these systems. And this means that we have to be uh, very didactical to explain things, uh, to give, uh, to be, for example, we have talked about accountability is something, those are tools, accountability, privacy, data, data protection, all these are, to, are tools towards principles of ethics. Thank you. So I guess I'm also, also expecting to answer this question. Um, I think none of these principles alone um, do help to us as a users or as a overall sort of those who live in cyberspace to um, have sufficient degree of um, security, right? Transparency alone, well, we know about the particular technology, what type of the code it's used and all of that. We do have the policies, but what actually, it, how can this help us to be more secure and feel more sort of secure and stable in cyberspace? So none of this principle alone um, actually helps to achieve what we want to achieve, but all together and many more could increase our actually ch chances to have this optimal security. But overall, I think we as humans need to be guided with the principle that we should avoid produce harm to each other, to, to others, with any type of technology, and AI is, of course, no exception here. Thank you, thank you for that. I think um, my secret wish sort of came true, and everyone sort of touched on the different principles. And but now I think um, it leaves us to sort of hear from our online audience as well. Um, I'm just going to invite uh, my colleague Johan to pull out the final survey question because I think it'll be interesting to hear what we have um, from the online audience. Um, basically, the question is: Please mark from one to six because we have six ethical principles. Please mark from one to six the significance of each ethical principle of AI use in cybersecurity. Six being most significant, very, very, very significant, and of course, one being, well, to you, the least significant of all six. Um, but I do agree with Nastio, so everything sort of comes together. It's um, Yeah, depends on how you formulate the principles. Amal is whispering to my ear. Let us wait some further minutes, pl uh, s uh, seconds, please, for the poll. Okay. In the meantime, I just thought I would like to say, you know, what are we going to do about the ethical principles that are in, well, currently in the sort of draft proposals stage, right? Um, so today, we have heard ideas that were discussed. We have had some new suggestions um, that were made, and the proposals um, will be further developed. It doesn't just stop here. Um, of course, the goal is to develop a basis that can serve as a guideline for industry, for research, um, for academia, you know, for politics and civil society and developing individual ethical principles. Um, so after this session, well, we will be 
publishing an impulse paper on ethical principles for the use of AI in cybersecurity, and it will also reflect the discussion results um, and will be made available for the IGF community as well. Um, in addition, of course, the paper can will, will, will be sent to our stakeholders to gather complementary um, feedback, and of course, Kaspersky will um, also further develop our own principles based on this paper and provide the best practices for the cybersecurity industry that we're in. So now, um, thank you for putting up the results from the poll, um, Johan. Um, so please mark from one to six the significance of each ethical principle of AI used in cybersecurity. I think we have... Johan, would you like to interpret these results for us because there are many colors? Yes, there are many colors, and it reflects that all of the six principles are important. So there is no priority. All of them um, are mentioned by the different um, attendees. And uh, it uh, makes clear that what you said, Nushin and also Dennis and, and Amal and, um, and Nastya, it is very important to take into account all that different principles and to start further multi-stakeholder discussion on, on that. So that's the um, result of the poll. Thank you very much for that. I think we can close the poll and I will just take one minute to sort of wrap up. Um, I think the key takeaways really are that the ethical principles all sort of come together as one to, and, and complement one another, and they need to be further developed beyond today's discussion. And of course, like Amal had said, you know, it really depends on how you frame it also, and that is something that we need to further develop. Um, so when it comes to transparency, safety, human control, privacy, d you know, defensive cybersecurity, and, 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 and being open for dialogue, these are by far far, I think, equally important principles that even our online audience have also agreed. Um, and I think the call, it, it, well, it remains for me to state then that, you know, the call for action would be um, that we need further international multi-stakeholder discussion on these ethical principles that we have developed and um, sort of designed. Um, they're not exactly rocket science, but I think it's about um, collating all of them into one document that is coherent and makes sense for everyone. Um, and of course, because we are you know, a player in the cybersecurity field, then we're of course particularly interested in developing such ethical principles for AI in cybersecurity. So I just wanna take this time um, to thank all of our audience today and people who have asked questions as well. I hope you know it has also furthered this discourse and also to thank all of our speakers, starting from Nastya, Amal, Dennis, and of course Nushin, and myself, I'm Jeannie from Kaspersky, signing off here. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a successful rest of um, your time in IGF. <laughs>